Hello, everybody. Um, just here to go through the um, second part of the belief systems administration for empires. So the last, sorry, just <laughs> really quick. Um, so the last part of unit three, which is I mean, actually is unit uh, or it's, they go in opposite order. So we did belief systems yesterday in class. Um, so we're going to do administrations and I'm doing this on video so that we don't take class time to do it and you can work on the MPs. So here we go. So when we look at empires and their administrations, the important question here is um, how did, sorry, I don't know if I, my video is where it is on your screen too or mine. It's been a minute since I've done Zoom. So um, the main question that College Board asks is, how do rulers legitimize and consolidate power in their empire? And to legitimize their um, their administration or their rule means like, how do they make people in their empire believe that like they should be ruling, right? Like if I, you know, declare myself queen of... Um, of a certain nation, which I absolutely should, um, like, why are people going to follow me? What is it about, like, how do I get them to be like, yeah, you know what? She's a good leader for us. We're going to hang on to this one. And then consolidate means like, remember, I'm going to point this out here, this big red box here. Um, there, like, this is a time of absolutism. Okay. So that means it's absolute rule. I'm the queen. I have the power, like it is, it's in me. And even if I'm sharing that power with other people, how do I work with them? So they're kind of on my side a little bit. Like, you know, in England, we'll watch them sort of like stack parliament with the justices of the peace, right? In the House of Commons. But parliament also kind of checked um, the monarchs. The monarchs in England were a little less absolutist than some of the others. Um, you know, but these other folks are like, how are you making sure that, because like, again, you can't just run your empire as one person. It doesn't work that way. So you have to trust some people to help you. And who do you trust, number one? And how do you make it so that you know they're loyal to you and not somebody else? So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. How do you make sure that you are funding your empire? How do you make sure that everybody knows that you're like the big one in charge. Okay. So that's what we're looking at today. With justifying and legitimizing rule, we'll look at this concept of the divine right of kings, which is not new, but, you know, kind of came about again, um, sort of revived itself through this. Um, looking at some art and architecture, um, like the way that you can convince somebody that you're the best is to build the palace of Versailles. I mean, it's, I've never be been there in person, but it's gorgeous. So like that would be this proof that, you know, I like I'm a glorious ruler and I have all of this power. Um, and then, of course, this concept of absolutism that we were talking about. And then from a governing standpoint, how do we set up this bureaucracy? How do we tax people? How do we collect taxes from people? What kind of military are we going to build up? You know, how are we making sure that, like, if we do end up fighting with our neighbors here, like, how are we going to beat them? And then um, some empires use proximity of these people um, in order to consolidate power. Like, for instance, in the Tokugawa shogunate, the daimyos are required to have, you know, residents, obviously, in their particular area, but also in what was called Edo, which is Tokyo. Um and if the daimyo himself was visiting his home place, like his family had to come to Tokyo and like hang out there as kind of like an insurance policy. So there's just a lot of like, there's like, I trust you, but like not really as far as I can throw you. Okay. All right. First way to legitimize divine right of kings. This is not a new concept, as I said. So like, you know, the Chinese philosophy had the mandate of heaven forever and ever and ever and ever ago. And it sort of, it, like I said, kind of revived itself through here to where, you know, these rulers were like, well, I, I God, God has blessed my rule. And obviously he has, or else 
I wouldn't be here, right? Like, of course he has done that. It's kind of like when we talked about Calvinism and this concept of predestination, like, well, why are you ruling? Well, because God intended it. Like, I didn't do anything. I mean, that's just the way it happened, right? So kind of the same idea. I mean, it's not predestination, obviously, but the same, like, God is the one who put me here sort of mentality. So King James I um, is known for this. He ruled a hundred years after um, Henry VIII, who was the one with all the wives and all the beheading and all the things. But of course, he was ruling in England. He was part of the Tudor um, family, Tudor monarchy. And he really kind of was what came out and he's like, look, I am the ultimate political and religious authority. Now, remember that um, Henry VIII had already gotten English parliament to be like, yep, you're in charge of the church too. So this was like, again, not a new concept for England either, just kind of doubled down on it. And so, but like to say that I am the political ruler as well as a religious leader, and I'm the ultimate authority on both of these things, then to challenge me is to challenge God. And that's not a good thing to do. We don't want to challenge God at this time, right? Like that is just I mean, these are, again, deeply religious people. And so they're like, well, no, of course not. Like, obviously God put him there. Like, who else would have done this, right, he, if he has the divine right? And the idea is somewhat supported in the Bible. Um, In this verse right here, let, in Romans chapter 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Well, of course, if you're reading that, you're like, well, Yeah. <laughs> If I'm here, clearly God put me here. And again, this by this time, people are reading the Bible in the vernacular. And so they're reading this going, well, I guess that makes sense, right? So they kind of justified the rule that way. All right. Now we're going to go through each of these empires and kind of like the, the specific things that they did to legitimize um, their rule to create loyalty among their um, the people who worked for them, to create this idea of like power and glory and, you know, show that they're the best, etc. So first in England, again, like I said, they were kind of like the least absolutist um, of this time. Now, again, there were there were kings and queens who took a lot of uh, a lot of power <laughs> and um, who really, you know, kind of ruled over uh, more so than others. But in terms of like the way that the government is set up, then of course, like parliament exists, right? So there is that legislative body that acted as a check on the monarch to a certain degree. So in England, they had set up the system of justices of the peace. And a justice of the peace is like, somebody who would be sent out into these various districts to kind of like settle disputes, but also like in favor of the monarch. <laughs> and they're settling disputes or executing laws that, you know, the king or queen of the time had put into place. So their loyalty is with the king. They were um, appointed by like the landed, like the gentry, right? But they, their loyalty was mainly to the king. But a lot of them ended up um, successfully going into parliament, into the House of Commons, and often sided with the monarch. So it was kind of the like, hey, do this for me. And then we end up in parliament and now we can all work together, right? But again, because England was a little more favorable to the people, they also instituted the English Bill of Rights. So it was drafted by Parliament and then signed into law um, by William and Mary, so the king and queen at the time in 1689. And that is that was really formed the basis of our Bill of Rights um, and gave a lot of the people who were colonizing um, in you know, what is now the U.S., the idea that they did have rights that were owed to them by their government was from the English Bill of Rights. Um, France is a hundred percent a different story <laughs> at the time. So France was definitely an absolute monarchy. 
I'm not sure how much it recorded of it, but I do need to share my screen. <laughs> One second. Where is it? There we go. Okay. We're back here. So again, I hope that that recorded still. I'm not going to end this just in case. I'm just going to go kind of go through it and then I'll be bummed out that like a half hour of my life just I can't get back. <laughs> it didn't work. Anyway, so like I said, France had more of an absolutist uh, take on ruling than England did. Monarchs had total and complete power. Obviously, they had a few advisors, you know, but the mo mostly like members of the royal family, right? They also had these people called intendants who were royal officials, and they were kind of like the justices of the peace in England a little bit. Like they were sent out into, um, you know, the French country <laughs> to execute orders and collect taxes. So they were called tax farmers, and we've heard that before. The, that was also a word that was used in the Ottoman Empire, too. So the tax farmers would go and collect on behalf of the monarch, go execute laws on behalf of the monarch. Now, Louis XIV, um, who ruled in the, from 1643 to 1715, so he had a, a minute there where he was um, the monarch in France, he was... At, he made the laws, he executed the laws, he was the judicial system. I mean, it was like all three branches of our government wrapped up into one guy to the point where at some point he said, uttered the words, l'état, c'est moi, which means I am, that c'est moi, I am, l'état is the state, I am the state, the state is me. <laughs> so basically like we're one and the same, like it doesn't matter. Like you're talking about the country of France, I am the country of France, what can I do for you today? Um, so he was very much, again, an absolutist, consolidated all of his power and didn't necessarily trust a lot of the, um, the nobility who worked for him. So he had Versailles, the Palace of Versailles built, which is like unbelievably beautiful, right? So this building right here, and here's the inside of it. And again, we're talking like the 16, like 1643 to 1715. And this is the stuff they're building. It's just unbelievable. Like this beautiful, beautiful architecture. And just so opulent and ostentatious and, you know, but really, again, showed like, I am so powerful that like my people built this palace for me with tax money. But anyway, so he had the palace built there and he made nobles move there so that he could kind of like keep an eye on them. Like he didn't trust them to kind of like run around and, you know, kind of live in their own space. And so he said, that's fine. You want to be a part of my, you know my regime, then great, you're going to live here. I mean, I could think of worse places to live than Versailles. Jesus, Pete, it's gorgeous. All right, moving on. Russia. We've talked about, um, real quick, when we talked about the Russian Empire back when we started all the individual empires, um, we talked about this Oprichnina. And the Oprichnina was this military force. And it, they were loyal to Ivan IV, who's Ivan the Terrible, right? Loyal to him alone. And if you will recall, Ivan IV and the boyars, who are the nobility um, in Russia, didn't get along very well. And the boyars were bummed out because they had had quite a bit of power. And then, you know, Ivan the Terrible and like took a lot of that away. And so they're like, oh, wait a second, this is not fair. And so there's this kind of this, you know, con like ongoing conflict between the boyars and Ivan IV. He didn't want to compete with them. And so he like, sent out the opportunity not to um, be kind of like this like police force, military force kind of. And um, they end up taking a lot of the lands from the boyars, which as you can imagine, didn't make them very happy. And then Peter the Great later on, who is a Romanov, we talked about him um, with respect to the church and kind of what he did to, um, to the Orthodox church. He got rid of the patriarch and he put in... Um, the Holy Synod in place of that, that answered to a secular official who answered to him. So he like really took a lot of the power away from the church. Um, he also, like he was in kind of a power struggle battle in the beginning of his reign, trying to see like who is going to be the legitimate ruler. And one of the ways that he kind of legitimized himself was by like 
kind of overpowering his sister who was like competing with him to get power and like sent her to a convent. He's like, no, we're, we're all done with you. You don't get to have any say in this. I am the rightful leader. You need to go to a convent. And she's like, what? right. So anyway, so that was one way to kind of consolidate the power more into one person. She had this force who was um, kind of loyal to her, like a police force, military force type called the Streltsy. And they rebelled against Peter the Great. And so he's like, well, you're all done. And so he disbanded them and reorganized the government, kind of got like disbanded the Streltsy completely for a time and then sort of absorbed them into his military after that. But like not where they were all so close together that they were, you know, working together and could like rise up against him again. Um, he reorganized the Russian government. He put the area, like the country into provinces. Um First, like, you know, eight of them and then like 50, right? So there's kind of, but like sending out, again, um, like people to administrate, administer, excuse me, in these places. Now, he also created a Senate to advise him, which it did, but like didn't have a ton of power. And then also, so the capital had been in Moscow and then he moved it to St. Petersburg. Yes. That is his name. Yes, that was named after him. <laughs> so, and built the Winter Palace. He had so commissioned the Winter Palace to be built in St. Petersburg. It was kind of kind of to do the same thing at Vers the, as um, Louis the Fourteenth was doing in Versailles, which is keep an eye on the nobility. There was a lot of the boyars that were kind of working in that area um, at the time, so sort of like a new trading area. And they were like building a lot of um, like a lot of infrastructure, a lot of um, new buildings and that sort of thing. And so um, to better keep an eye on the nobles, he, of course, had this palace built um, at St. Petersburg called the Winter Palace. And what you should notice, because remember, Russia was kind of always in this like, are you Europe or are you Asia? And Russia kind of always saw themselves as European. Europe didn't necessarily know, um, you know, which one they were. And so Russia, a lot of times would do things to make it appear as though they were more European than Asian. And the architecture of the Winter Palace is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, it definitely looks, you know, in the same kind of style as the things that were being built um, at the time in other countries in Europe. I mean, such as Versailles, right? So like, that's the Winter Palace. That's Versailles. Winter Palace, <laughs> Versailles. So again, kind of taking a nod from European architecture. Um, moving out of Europe for a moment over um, into the Middle East, into the Ottoman Empire. We've talked about the Devshermi system as well, which was that um, kind of forced selective service system um, in the Ottoman Empire in which Christian boys would be recruited by force um, to serve in the Ottoman government. They were very highly educated. They were treated very, very well. They ended up being very loyal to the Sultan. Many of them converted to Islam. Um, if you're in the military part of it, you were um, what's called a Janissary. That's a picture of the Janissaries, what they, you know, an artist rendering the Janissaries at that time. And so it wasn't like you certainly weren't treated as, you know, many people who are, you know, forced into labor were treated like they were treated very well. But the loyalty was built um, through taking them from their families and kind of raising them under the thumb of the Sultan. And so these people are no longer loyal to their families or to their initial religion, but they have converted, they are loyal to the Sultan. Um, and that kind of creates this, this force of people who are willing to, you know, willing to go to bat for you, willing to, you know, invoke policy for you, willing to fight for you, et cetera. They also had, as we said, they had the tax farmers um, in the Ottoman empire, and again, the Ottoman Empire had a super powerful military and they just continuously needed money. So um, what do you do? Well, you tax people. And unfortunately, the peasants were the ones who were, you know, most heavily taxed in the Ottoman Empire. So 
they were not like super pleased um, by the tax system in the Ottoman Empire. This is down at the bottom right here, the Suleimani Mosque um, that's in Istanbul. Again, just another example of these leaders who are just building these like, in, like unbelievably monstrous and gorgeous structures um, you know, in their name and during their rule. And again, it's just, it's a power. It's a power play. It's a show of glory. It's like, look at what they built for me, etc. Okay. Moving on to Japan. Tokugawa shogunate isn't, I don't, it's not like specifically an empire that's listed, but it is mentioned in the college world curriculum. So we're going to talk about them for a second. Plus it's like a, just a really interesting story too. So the social structure in Japan had been like mostly a feudal system, okay? And you had, again, like a lot of these other places would have your nobles and then, you know, the the people who fought for them, like their military and then the serfs, right? So you can almost look at this and be like, boy, that looks a lot like, you know, the nobles and the knights and the serfs in feudal England. And there are similarities. It certainly was not the same, um, but there's a little bit of similarity in the hierarchy of the system and the feudal system itself. So the um, those who were the landowning elite in Japan were called the daimyo and the samurais were their military force. Um, who worked for the daimyo. So each daimyo had a group of samurais, like a force of samurais. They were salaried. They were paid by the daimyo. And then, of course, you know, the peasants who are the ones who are working the land and like the merchant class and all the other things. But again, it was essentially a feudal system for a very long time. And then once gunpowder emerges, we have people that try to take more power. So in Japan, what that looked like was three different um, daimyos, one after the other, that um, together, like when you put them all together, unified Japan, okay? So the first was Nobunaga, who initially took Kyoto. And when he died, um, I believe he was assassinated, um, about a third of Japan was unified. And then after that, it was Hideyoshi, who ended up unifying most of Japan. And after him came Tokugawa Ieyasu. And he was declared shogun. So shogun was above daimyo, okay? Like shogun is like leader, essentially. So he was declared shogun in 1603. And with that, the Tokugawa shogunate was established. So he moved the center of power excuse me, in Japan to what was then called Edo, which is Tokyo today. And under the Tokugawa shogunate was this period of great peace. And it lasted until the mid 1800s. So over 200 years. Um, and you can see here the Tokugawa shogunate unified about or started about 1600, 1603, but it's fine. Um, and lasted till 1867. So there was a pretty long, uh, peaceful, prosperous period in Japan. During this time, of course, they're kind of, you know, pushing out European influence prior to and during this time, trying to push out European influence. Um, remember the Portuguese and the Dutch kind of got in um, for a little bit, tried to convert people to Christianity. And mostly the Japanese were like, no, we're not really buying it. <laughs> like, kind of have our own thing going on here and we're not really that interested. And now because some people did convert and they were starting to see these influences in Japan, that's when they kind of kicked out the Europeans and sort of closed off to um, to that more interregional trade. Um, the Tokugawa shogunate, again, had taken a decentralized feudal system and centralized it into like one government. So they reorganized it. They centralized control in Tokyo or in Edo. And they made their, I believe I mentioned this in the very beginning of this, they made their daimyo keep residences in their area. So like, again, each of the daimyo has like a, their own little, you know, area of land. And they had a residence there, but they also had to keep a residence in Tokyo. Kind of like Versailles, right? So 
and we're looking at comparing those two, um, you know, what would be similar about France and Japan during this time is that leaders made their nobility and the people who worked for them in high level positions in the government live near them. <laughs> and so it was literally proximity that was allowing this. And again, it's because you're talking about the 1600s, right? There's not a lot of quick communication that can take place. Um, there isn't a way for people to, you know, to, to know what's going on somewhere without actually being there. Um, and they went so far though, so like distrusting of the daimyo that if a daimyo went to visit his home area for whatever reason, the family had to stay in um, in Tokyo while the daimyo was off. And there was, again, kind of like this insurance policy, like, well, if your family's here, you'll probably come back. So there was, a, again, a bit of mistrust in that. Lastly is the Mughal Empire. And whenever we talk about the Mughal Empire, we usually talk about, again, Akbar, who ruled at its height. Um, so he was from 1556 to 1605. And he ruled not by force. Like he was not the absolutist that like Louis the 14th was. Um, he wasn't somebody that, you know, made his government officials live um, in a super specific area. He ruled by like just being tolerant and like really wanting to kind of hear all the great ideas, regardless of who they came from. Now, of course, he was you know, he also like expanded the empire. So there was, there was some defeating happening that, you know, throughout, like they expanded um, South and West. They defeated some Hindu armies. Of course, he was a Muslim coming into a, um, a relatively Hindu um, area. As we know, there were some people, there were Muslims here just from trade, um, really, right? Those Muslim merchants in the diasporic communities and what have you. And there's also Buddhists. And so there's, again, we talked about that in class, like he kind of took over a, a, a relatively diverse place in terms of religion, especially. But he created um, what is historically known as a very fair and a very well-administered government. Um, and he kind of, again, was not afraid to bring in a whole lot of other people that were not necessarily from his same viewpoint um, to, you know, give them jobs, to take, you know, what they say into consideration. We talked in belief systems about the fact that, like, you know, people would come to him of varying religions and say, like, we need land for this or we need money for this. He's like, okay, great. And so he, he would give money or give land to Hindus, to Muslims, to Catholics, to Sikhs. Right. So all of this was kind of this grand show of tolerance that ended, you know, shortly after Akbar was there. Um, but it was for a time a very, like, very powerful and very well respected um, empire. Like, people literally would like come and like hear about Akbar. They're like, this guy's amazing. And they would come in from Central Asia, like, to get a job. Um, in this government, because that's kind of like his reputation in the area. Um, they had, so like the French had the tax farmers, the Ottoman had the tax farmers. These guys had the Zamindars. Um, they were kind of like the civil servants, right? And when I say servant, I, civil servants means you work in government. Okay, so in the civil service. So they were in the civil service. They were put in charge of, you know, collecting taxes and whatnot. So in that respect, they were kind of like the tax farmers, but also like overseeing projects. So they would oversee infrastructure projects. They would oversee new construction. They would oversee the water supply. So they were people who were, um, you know, specifically in that role to kind of take charge of very certain areas. But again, as happens in many of these empires, um, once Akbar was no longer in power, um, the Zamindars started, you know, kind of siphoning a little bit off the top there. <laughs> and, you know, so collecting taxes, sure, and sending most of it back to the government, but also, you know, skimming some off the top, keeping it for themselves. And what they did is tried to build up like their own 
you know, personal just in case armies and people who would be loyal to them should anything, um, should anything happen. So the other thing you should know though about the Mughal empire is like, again, the architectural displays of like power and glory. Um, I mean, there is none other than the Taj Mahal, right? So we've talked several times about the Taj Mahal, um, which was built by Shah Jahan as a tomb for his wife. And um, and it's funny because then you look up his tomb. I should have put a picture of it on it. You look up his tomb, you're like, well, <laughs> you know, as compared to the Taj Mahal. Um, but there was a lot of money that was spent on good things like infrastructure and, you know, the water supply and stuff, but also on like, again, very opulent buildings. Like this is a mausoleum. It's a tomb, you know? And like, that's what it is. Like that huge, amazing, like, you know, kind of seven wonders of the world type place is, um, took a lot of money, a lot of manpower <laughs> and, you know, was maybe, maybe not the best use of money, except for the fact that like, we just find it still amazing and, you know, wonder, wonderful and glorious to this day. Um, the other thing about the Mughal empire, their power through art and architecture, they are really a great display of that concept of syncretism that we've talked about, right? So art and architecture, um, specifically like Hindu, Hindu style and um, Islamic style would come together in these uh, beautiful pieces of art and beautiful um, buildings of architecture. And so again, that kind of shows like these, like the the styles. So therefore the cultures, you know, are mixing together kind of into one. All right. And that is it for... Um, for empires and administration. So how they uh, legitimize their power and how they consolidate power. So again, like examples, like legitimizing mandate of heaven, all the big buildings that are built, um, you know, just kind of like all the, like the glorious things <laughs> that are, that are happening, the advisors that are loyal to them and that sort of thing and consolidating power again, is like taking more for it, right? For yourself. And whether that's Louis the 14th and who is like, again, the kind of legislative executive and judicial branch all wrapped into one. And then, um, you know, on to even like how Akbar consolidated power by welcoming more people and more ideas and more thoughts into there. So like, those two things can look very different from each other in different empires, like the consolidation of power, but understanding how those are done and being able to give examples of that is important. Okay. So I am hoping again, I'm hoping that this recorded and um, yeah, if you have any questions on any of it, you just let me know. I'm trying to figure out how to stop my recording now. And again, haven't done Zoom in a while. Thank goodness, right? So uh, yeah, we shall see you later. Bye.